Hello, everyone. Thanks for joining us for a session today, uh, giving a recap of the 2022 legal trends report from our friends at Clio. My name is Kristen Tyler. I'm one of the co-founders here at lawclerk.legal, and I'm thrilled to be joined by my colleague, Brooke Davis, who's here. Brooke, welcome. Hi. Brooke is our Associate Counsel for Legal Talent Strategy. That's a big lot of words. Um, she is working in a variety of roles at the company, primarily with our subscription team and leading that effort. So um, Brooke's also a practicing attorney, uh, for those of you who may not know her background or was a former practicing attorney. So I'm really excited to get your input on some of the data that came out of this year's report. But um, first off, I just, Brooke and I, we both had the chance to attend the Clio conference. What was that, three weeks ago now? And I don't know about you, but I had a great time. It was such a great event. It was really wonderful to be back in person. It was by far the largest legal conference I've been to since the pandemic. Um, and the energy there at the Clio conference was just really good. I don't know, Brooke, was that your first Clio conference or not? No, I've been to several Clio conferences, but I think for sure it was the biggest. And um, I don't know, I didn't see the attendance numbers, but uh, there were a lot of people there. There was a lot of energy and even in the expo hall, um, it was a really good sized expo hall and turnout. So it was really exciting. Uh, I could tell people were really excited to be back in person. So for sure, for sure. Um, and I think a lot of the conversations we had that week really match up with the findings and the report. So I'm excited to go through that today, but okay. Without further ado, let me kick this off and we'll, we did prepare a few slides here. Just if you haven't had a chance to look at the, um, do you see the report there? Was that right? Yeah. Okay. Um, so you, um, you know, if you haven't had a chance to download a copy of the report, you'll have it here. But this is what we're doing today um, and to our agenda today. So this is our roadmap of where we're going. There's a few different kind of categories of some of the data that we found that we wanted to share. Uh, first up, kind of the report gave a status check on the industry, just kind of how things are going in general for lawyers and law firms. We'll talk through that. We're going to look at the data about when and where we as lawyers are working um, hiring and retention data, what clients want in today's legal market, and last but not least, some hourly rate data that Clio released. I was really interested in that. So uh, we'll, we'll be pulling that up as well. But first off, I did want to give a big thanks again to our friends at, at Clio. Um, this is a big undertaking that their company does every year. I think this was the sixth iteration of this report. And I know that, that internally they have a big team that works on gathering this data. The data comes from anonymizing data from their user accounts across the country. So they have data from tens of thousands of legal professionals that, that goes into these findings. In addition to that, they conducted a survey of over 1,100 legal professionals uh, between April and May of this year, April and May 2022, and that's the other big data source for some of the findings in the report. Now, again, if you haven't downloaded a copy yet, it really is an easy read, but we're going to give you kind of the executive summary today. But you can visit Clio.com, and they have a, right now they have a banner up on the top of their screen, and you can download a whole copy there. You don't have to have a Clio account or be a Clio user to get this information. So if you're interested, go check it out. All right, I'm going to kick it off now and walk you through some of the statistics that they provided about kind of the state of the legal industry, uh, what's going on. If you've talked to any lawyers lately, uh, it, probably the most common thing we're hearing from everyone is, oh my gosh, I'm so busy. There has just been a deluge of work. People seem to be busier than ever. And the data matched up with that. Uh, you know, the demand for legal services reached record highs, higher than the numbers that we saw in 2019, which was really encouraging. Billings were up, um, excuse me, caseloads were up about 10%. Uh, and then billable hours were up about 22%. So it that matches up and shows the huge volume of work that's really coming out of the industry lately. And of course, just because we're billing those hours, we don't know if we're collecting them, but we'll talk about that as well. So this was one of the graphs that they provided that shows, um, you know, again, about a 20% jump in matters being open in the Clio system, billable hours up 35%. Build dollars uh, up 36%, and then collections also really strong. So this really shows how robust the industry is right now. And again, like I said, you really don't need a, a chart like this to know that. If you just talk to any, <laughs> most lawyers, you're going to hear this same story from them in their own words about how much work there is out there in all practice areas, really. Uh, in terms of uh, 
collection rates and realization rates, those have really kind of plateaued since they started keeping this data in 2016. They're, they did find growth, but you know, on a whole across the average, you're seeing about an 84% realization rate. And that is the number of hours billed uh, divided by the number of hours worked. So, you know, of course, there's going to be some cuts to hours worked for younger associates, especially, but uh, still mid 80s is a strong number. And then the collection hours is the number of hours collected divided by the number of hours billed. And that's staying really strong at 89%. So, you know, those that's a really good KPI that if you don't track that for your own firm, it's good to see how you match up against kind of this industry average from the data we get from Clio. And uh, can be a good benchmark for you to work for and move move along and try to improve your own firm. Now, I, another thing I thought was really interesting, I don't remember this from past Clear reports, was they gave some data on the average cost of a billable hour. Now, this is across the whole U.S. This is all practice areas. So it's a very, you know, average number. But they showed the average lawyer rate at $313. Uh, the CPI, which is the Consumer Price Index, which is tied to inflation, was at 296. Um, the firm rate, the billable firm rate, kind of the, you know, across senior partners, junior partners, uh, non-lawyers was 281. And then the average non-lawyer rate, so think a paralegal, like a law clerk, was 164. So this was really some interesting data to show how that has, uh, you know, lawyer rates have outpaced the CPI, which, again, uh, is an indicator of inflation for a long time, uh, but it's catching up to us. And, uh, you know, based on data that came out after their reporting period, it is uh, be becoming a bigger issue for lawyers and law firms as we're feeling the crunch of inflation, just like everyone else. So we're going to go into some more detailed hourly rate data later on by state and practice area. But I, Brooke, I thought I would turn it over to you if you could walk us through some of the data that came out about when and where lawyers are working. I thought this was some of the most interesting data. Sure. Yeah, I thought so, too. Um, I think, too, because the perception of like where we work and when we work has shifted so dramatically um, because of the pandemic. So um, prior to this, as you know, I ran a virtual firm for a long time. There was a lot of legal technology out there and, and a lot of attorneys didn't really feel a need that I talked to um, to change how they were operating because things were working. And so uh, we were all kind of forced into adopting a lot of these technologies and the technology has come a long way. So um, some of the stuff that we found in this report was that office use has actually declined and that people are becoming more comfortable um, with actual uh, technology and, and working in different places. I think uh, prior, we thought, um, you know, courthouses and on the go, we're used to working in those, you know, different kinds of environments. And those were typical environments. Uh, but now we're moving to home-based offices and maybe office shares and some other creative things. And so um, the data here uh, really was suggesting that this isn't just, um, there were some variations in ages but um, I think it might be on the next slide. Um, yeah, so um, of where legal professionals are spending their day. So you'll see that, I mean, it's pretty close that non-lawyers, uh, your support staff, your um, paralegals, they're spending a little bit more time in the office than the lawyers are, uh, but it's, it's pretty close uh, there. And then I think and I think these numbers match up with a lot of the hybrid that we're hearing about, too. Yeah, that I think so, out. too. Um, I think hybrid, I, th I think we're probably seeing more hybrid than we are truly completely remote office work situations, um, even for solos, even if they do not have a support staff. For sure. For sure. Um, yeah. And this, again, it's more data as far as, uh, you know, fewer legal professionals working exclusively from an office. I think this is still more for the, the hybrid office as well. Absolutely. And I'm in, there we go. Um, yeah, so the lawyer activity throughout the workday, uh, I, I think this is probably pretty accurate that lawyers want flexibility and when they prefer to work, um, even though the actuality is that a lot of lawyers are still working traditional hours. Um, but you also see that there are a lot of after hours, which was kind of concerning for me. Um, I think we do have kind of an issue with 
well-being in our profession. We'll see later some data that came out um, about reasons that people are, are leaving um, their jobs. But I think part of it is uh, these after hours you see a lot of people actually don't want to work. A lot of lawyers don't want to work um, these hours, but they are working those hours. So I thought that was really interesting data that it just having that flexibility. I was glad to see there was no prefer to work at 3 a.m. Like at least that's an hour we can agree. No one wants to work at 3 a.m., right? Picked up around four. Picked up around yeah, four. Yeah. Maybe a four, but not three. <laughs> right. And then, I mean, again, a lot of lawyers, you know, are wanting, not wanting to work Friday, Saturday, Sunday. I like how a lot of lawyers don't want to work on Monday as well. But um you know, you see the actuality of it again is there's a lot of work there. And honestly, um, you know, do clients really want us to work those hours? Do they need us to work those hours? And I think there are definitely some practice areas, particularly maybe in the criminal world that, you know, it may be impractical for you to not have some, you know, unconventional hours. But overall, um, I, I do think that there are ways that we could uh, get these numbers down and be able to work when we actually prefer to work uh, as opposed to kind of letting um, letting our perceptions of what clients want dictate when we are working. Yeah, and here, I mean, you can't, it, it's not a lot, a big discrepancy between the age groups for when they're working outside of regular hours or regular work week. Um, there's some slight variations in here, but really, um, this data suggested it's not a generational uh, issue. It's not new graduates. It's not necessarily people who are later in their career or early in their career. Um, it, it's just kind of what we're all doing. And, and I'm curious if it's just kind of, this is what we've always done or what we think we should be doing. Um, if technology is playing a role maybe in uh, our need to stay connected um, and, and not putting some of those uh, time barriers in there. So. Yeah, I think this was really interesting because I, um, you know, I think that for, you know, some of the, my partners and other lawyers I've worked with in my career who uh, were later on in their career than I was, you know, it was a badge of honor that they were a workaholic and they work a lot of days and they work a lot of hours. And I think that while some people joke about, oh, millennials don't work or Gen Z doesn't work, um, we do, but it's just at different times. Maybe it's not as much those traditional hours or those traditional days. They, they like the flex time more than some of the other generations. But yeah, and this was really interesting to me that I thought too, that it wasn't really a generational mix. We all are working a lot and just kind of at different times. Right. And I think it goes back to lawyers wanting to be able to work when they want to work. They want the flexibility to do that and and do it when they're most productive and efficient. For sure. For sure. And this, too, I mean, most most lawyers offer to work with clients outside of business hours. And so, um, you know, meeting after hours in an office, there's very little difference in lawyers who offer that and clients who want that. Um, you see communication after hours, lawyers offer that. And I was kind of, this kind of interesting to me to see like the communication piece, the clients didn't necessarily want it as much as lawyers offered it. That was very interesting in this data for me um, because we do have that technology and the ability um, to be available. But that also tells us that if we don't want to work on weekends and maybe we don't have to work on weekends, the clients aren't necessarily looking for that. So. Right. Yeah. Maybe they want to be left alone and not think about their legal issues on their, their weekend. Right. <laughs> so right. very interesting. All right. This like, takes us into some of the data on hiring and retention within the legal industry. And again, this has been another big hot topic. Um, if you've read a newspaper or a magazine in the last year, you've certainly heard about, you know, the great resignation and legal has not been immune to that. Uh, my friend Lawrence Coletti with the Legal Talk Network, if you listen to any of their podcasts, Lawrence likes to call it the great lateral. There's been a lot of movement with lawyers and legal professionals. Um, you know, 37% of lawyers left or are considering leaving a job uh, because of better pay. And a lot of lawyers are making moves because they don't want to be forced to be physically present in an office. They want the flexibility. They want to work from home. So again, you know, looking at the data of the last the last year, 19% uh, of lawyers have moved jobs, and only about 9% uh, 
plan to move in the next six months. So this was interesting. Maybe this great lateral is kind of settling and we're not going to see as much upheaval, but who knows? We don't have that crystal ball. Now, why are they leaving? Lawyers that are leaving are primarily pointing to better pay and better work-life balance. Uh, you know, they know that they have a lot of power in this market from what we've heard from a lot of um, associates looking to make moves. They, they are very aware of that, uh, that there are, you know, hiring wars, there are firms constantly raising rates and salaries for junior attorneys to try to attract that top talent, get them to move over. Uh, but there are also as much as they value better pay, they also value their own well-being. And that's becoming something that's a bigger focus for this, uh, a lot of newer lawyers, which is great. You can see a lot of the other uh, factors there too, but by far, pay and well-being are uh, equal and competing factors causing a lot of lawyers to make a move. Now, um, again, as we've already talked about, the flexibility of being allowed to be treated like a professional and work when you want to work as long as you get your work done is huge to a lot of lawyers. I've, uh, you know, early in my career, I had worked for one attorney who wanted you in your chair from this time to this time, no matter what, even if you didn't have anything to work on, you didn't have any meetings, needed to be in the office these hours. And I can tell you, I worked way harder when I had uh, the flexibility in my career and I could work from home. I could work from the office. I could set my own hours to, to manage my caseload at a different position later on. So, you know, there's pros and cons to everything, but definitely be aware of the flexibility that younger attorneys want, excuse me, and are demanding in their professional careers. Again, looking at, uh, you know, remote work, uh, there is a strong preference to prefer working from home, uh, at least having that as an option. And that matches up with what our lawyer or our clients want. You know, um, about a third of clients want the option for virtual meetings and about a third want in person and the other third one a combination. So, you know, we need to be having that conversation. That's something that, um, you know, I, I know a lot of lawyers are leading with, well, how would you prefer to meet? Here are the options and laying them out and letting the client guide how you want to meet and do business. And the good news is that uh, because more and more clients also want the virtual meetings and the remote option, that opens the door to allowing you to hire talent who can staff those needs and those meetings remotely from wherever they are, which is really exciting. So, Brooke, do you have some more data for us on what clients want that came out of the report? Great. Yeah. Um, so one of the things that I found interesting, I'll start with that, um, was again, since we're talking about being remote, uh, a lot is the office type, whether it's home or commercial, um, there was only, um, one <laughs> in, the, in the impact score out of a hundred for office type. And so, um, I, you know, I've heard a lot of pushback on, you know, needing to be in a traditional office space. And so, um, and working, like you said, sitting in a chair, you know, from eight to five. And so I thought that was really interesting um, data, but responsive, I was, well, obviously reviews um, are huge as far as impact, but responsiveness and um, the location were tied with the 16 impact score. So um, kind of the implication of that is that, you know, firms can dramatically improve their competitive advantage um, by responding quickly. Um, and also people want a local attorney and that doesn't necessarily mean someone sitting in an office with you in your, you know, physical space, but someone that is local. So I thought that was really interesting. Um, that those two had a similar score uh, and clients do want you to be responsive, but I think um, we need to look at maybe how we're being responsive. Uh, part of that is again, you know, we've mentioned technology a few times, but um, you know, that can allow you, we don't want you to have to work every, <laughs> every weekend or three o'clock in the morning, like we were talking about. So I don't, I don't think that's what this data necessarily suggests, um, but as a way to, you need to find a way to be responsive. So whether that's, you know, if somebody reaches out, you have some kind of automatic message, whether you have a chat bot, you know, embedded somewhere that's actually communicating with your, um, with your clients, or if you have some kind of a, a portal system, client portal system, where they can, you know, communicate with you, even if you're not necessarily responding. And so I think that's probably what is meant by responsiveness, just having some kind of client touch point, um, but I thought that was really interesting that that was ranked just as high as, as location. Um, and that's, you know, 
I think that's always been kind of true. Responsiveness has always been really important, but I think we can kind of step back and look at how we can do that differently and also manage some of those things um, that are really important that we just mentioned to attorneys um, as far as having that work-life balance and things like that. No, nope, trying to get your next slide here. There we go. I know it's not letting me advance the slides. So, um, yeah, so clients want lawyers to offer more billing options, like you mentioned um, earlier. So it, it's, again, versus clients or what lawyers think clients want and what clients actually want. And um, you can see here that there are a few different options listed and clients want more flexibility in how they're being billed. Um, and uh, I think maybe on the next slide, um, I actually thought it real quick. I thought it was really interesting. The monthly subscriptions um, were something that clients are thinking about and obviously want, um, and lawyers aren't really necessarily thinking that that's something uh, that clients want. Uh, so, you know, there is there are unique ways, and you're going to talk about our subscriptions later, but there are unique, unique ways um, to be able to do that and to build clients. Um, and it, it looks that clients are receptive to having that kind of unconventional billing relationship as well. But yet, <laughs> <laughs> yes, here we are, are uh, at this slide, 36 uh, percent, only 36 percent of law firms um, offer flat fees and you see 10 percent contingency there. But almost all of law firms continue to offer hourly rates. That's a pretty big percentage. Um, I know some of these are combination hourly and flat fee. Um, but as the data shows, you know, we need to be looking especially with inflation um, and trying to find creative ways to maybe in increase our, you know, profits without having to increase our fees too much. And, and one of the ways to possibly do that to give us back maybe some time and to be more efficient is to create, you know, alternative payment plans, whether that's a flat fee or some kind of combination of both. You know, I think, you know, everything has been, Life is always very uncertain, but it's, it feels like it's been more uncertain the past few years. And uh, a lot of clients want to have more certainty when they're dealing with a scary legal situation to know what they're going to pay and what it's going to cost. And so being sensitive to that and also acknowledging, you know, I think every lawyer I know has a love hate with the billable hour. Mm -hmm. uh, they love it because it has helped our industry make a lot of money for a lot of years, but they also hate it because they hate tracking what they're doing every minute of every day. And so, you know, if you're able to give the client more of what they want with that certainty of what they're going to pay for the service and take away the stress of tracking your every minute of every day, that's a win-win for both sides too. So, you know, do I would really challenge anyone who's thought about trying some of these alternative solutions to test them out, play with them. And if they don't work, you can always go back to hourly, but uh, you'll never know if you don't try. Well, and I think consumers also are accustomed in other industries um, of having that price transparency. So it, it's something that we haven't necessarily caught up to um, with like general consumer trends as well. That's for sure. That's for sure. Yeah. And using technology to serve your clients better. You know, I've mentioned a few times, there are a few different tools that you can use. You know, you can use your online portal for clients. That's a great touch point. Um, if, if you feel like you need to be connected to your clients on the weekend, having an, an online portal is, is a great way to do that. They can, you don't necessarily have to communicate with them on the weekend, but if, you know, they have something come up that they really need to get out and reach out to you, there's a way for them to communicate with you. Um, and then you can just get back to them on your own time. Um, but also online scheduling tools, all of these are about efficiency. Um, and again, trying to be smart about how we're spending our time, how we're spending our money. Um, and then e-signature options, electronic intake forms, online payments, all of those things um, can help you not only, you know, get to some of that work-life balance that seems to be pretty desirable, uh, but also to help you become more efficient in your practice, to become more profitable in your practice. And so I think we're, we're at a point now that there are a lot of options, legal and non-legal uh, technology available to help us really create these um, 
practices that will help us, you know, get past any kind of inflation, uh, meet clients where they are. We just have to really kind of get outside of our um, conventional box and and think how can we uh, create kind of a law firm that's going to sustain beyond and and be able to find alternative ways, whether that's technology or outsourcing um, or however we're operating just in a more unconventional way. Absolutely. I think all these tools are a big win, not only for clients, but for us too, if it can reduce some of our own stress. So these are great things that the report highlighted. All right. So another new feature in this year's Clio Legal Trends report that I've not seen in prior years was was they provided several appendices of data on hourly rates by state and practice area. Um, But one thing that they found across the board was they uh, put forth the um, suggestion that, you know, the data suggests that on average, most lawyers could increase their rates by 3% to keep up with changes in the consumer price index, changes in inflation. So, you know, that's a pretty big jump, 3%. And honestly, with, you know, over the summer, the inflation rate in the CPI went up so much higher. I think it peaked out at about 9%. Um, I'm sure now that we're nearing year end, a lot of law firms are considering uh, an increase in rates and what feels reasonable to match their needs versus their clients' constraints. Um, But this is what the data in this report found. It was suggesting that most firms could probably up rates by 3%. Um, And to tie that into something Brooke was saying earlier, and when she and I were talking about this, some of this data uh, before the webinar, you know, Brooke said, you know, again, another way to make this easier, if you are going to increase rates, start talking to clients about ways you can help them make those payments. You know, like you shouldn't be expected to be your client's bank, uh, but there are ways that you can make sure you're still getting paid and make it easier for them, whether that's payment plans. I know a lot of lawyers who have not had payment plans in the past have started that, um, you know, uh, success fees. There's a lot of ways that we've already talked about. You can get creative if you're trying to bring more revenue into your firm by increasing fees while still making it uh, manageable for your clients as well. So if you, when you download the report, you can pull the hourly, the average hourly rate by state. They broke it up based on kind of a, um, you know, a rate for the firm as an entirety, everything from senior partners to paralegals, uh, they broke down the rates for just lawyers in the firm and then for the non-lawyers. And I thought this was really interesting. This was the raw data. Um, and so you can see here, let's let's pick on um, we'll just pick on Alabama since they're up there first. You know, the lawyer rate was 211 an hour uh, versus if you look at Connecticut, you know, 350 an hour. So now later on, the next page of the report does provide an adjusted rate by that's based on cost of living in that state, which is pretty interesting. So, you know, here we go, Alabama, we go for a lawyer 211 to 240. Um, Connecticut goes from 321 to or 350 to 321. So all of this data is really interesting to think about, uh, you know, the cost of living in different markets. And that's a factor of what you were paying your employees and what you're charging your clients. Um, So then it does go into practice areas. Now, this is average across the U.S. They did not break it out by practice area and state yet. Wouldn't that be great data? I'm sure maybe that's coming at some point in the future, but uh, they did give us, and again, this is just a snippet of a small part of the graph. If I put the whole thing on here, it'd be so tiny you couldn't see it, but they had a whole long page of different practice areas. And I think this is really information, uh, really good information. I wanted to tie this in to how you could use this with the work you're doing with Law Clerk. And I see from our live attendees today, some of you are hiring attorneys, some of you are freelance attorneys. And so I wanted to talk through both a project-based example and a, a subscription about how you could use this data when you're doing work through Law Clerk. And honestly, our team is going to be bookmarking this and saving it as well when we're talking to you. If you need help pricing projects or you need help uh, you know, figuring out the economics of a subscription, we're going to be pulling this out to help have those conversations with you. But okay, let's look first at a project, project-based project example. Excuse me. So example one, a project on Law Clerk is done on a flat fee. It's a single piece of work. It's, uh, if you haven't ever posted a project before, it's like, hey, I need someone to come in and write this demand letter and I'm going to pay this flat fee. I need someone to come in and prepare a research memo. I'm going to pay this flat fee. And some lawyers get hung up on not knowing how much to pay for that fee. So let's talk through an example. Okay, let's say that you uh, need someone to write a motion for summary judgment and you're uh, a Texas lawyer and the area of law is elder. I don't know what a motion for summary judgment would be on elder law, but it could happen, right? 
um, and that you estimate that this is probably going to take someone about eight to 10 hours of work to write this motion. Okay, so those are our basic facts. We have the data from the Clio report on the hourly rate for lawyers based on Texas, based on elder law. Um, so what should you pay for a flat fee project? Our general advice for years has been, uh, if you're going to pay a freelance lawyer, you could calculate their hourly rate to be about 35 to 40% of the market rate. Okay. So if we use the market rate of $313 an hour in Texas, uh, that 35 to 40% rate would be about $110 to $125 an hour for that work. Okay. That's a ballpark. Obviously, if you're asking someone to do this miraculously in two days, then you're going to be paying a rush fee. <laughs> but you know, there's a lot of factors that go into our pricing, but you'll get the hang of it. It's, it's uh, more of an art than a science and you'll get good at it really quickly. So let's say that you decide, um, I think this is uh, the lower end, the 110, and I just took 110 an hour times eight hours and then times 10 hours. So I think, you know, a flat fee in the $900 to $1,200 range would be right on par for this type of work uh, based on all these factors. Okay. So that's, you know, again, you're going to decide what you want to pay. Um, certainly you might attract a different caliber of freelancer if you price the project at 880 versus if you price it at 1250, but you can play with that and see what pricing works the best for the work that you need. Okay. So that's what you're paying a freelancer to do the project through law clerk. What does this mean on the back end in terms of what you can bill to your client? Okay. Um, so taking this data, let's say that you determine based on these market rates, uh, you know, you, you're looking at this for non-lawyers in Texas and elder law. Those are, you know, 150 to 155 starting and then all the way up to lawyers at 313. So, you know, it would be reasonable to bill the freelancer's time to your client somewhere between $160 an hour to maybe 250, maybe 300 an hour, depending on how much expertise the freelancer has that you hire for this project. Okay. So the freelancer is going to do the work, write the motion. Even though you're paying them a flat fee for the project, they are going to track their time and give you a time report so that you can see how much time they spent on the work um, and you know how that matched up with your expectations as well. So you know how to better price them in the, the future. Uh, for purposes of example, let's say you ended up paying a flat fee uh, through law clerk for the project of $1,000. The freelancer comes back and reports that they worked nine hours on the project writing this motion for you you decide that a rate of $200 an hour is reasonable based on all these market factors and the freelancer's expertise. So you can bill this freelancer's work of drafting the motion to the client at $1,800. Keeping in mind, you paid law clerk a thousand. That brings in an additional $800 of revenue on just one project. I know that was a lot of math and I know there's a lot of jokes about lawyers on math, but I hope this makes sense. Um, and we certainly, maybe I'll turn this into a worksheet that we can use too, but um, this was great data to show uh, what kind of ballparks of ranges are reasonable both to pay for work and to uh, build to your client. Okay. So this was a project, project example. Any questions, Brooke, anything you think I'm missing on here? No, I think this is a really good explanation. Oh, thank you. Okay. It's a lot of numbers. Let's do one now on the subscription side. So if you haven't heard about law clerks, Subscription program, it's exactly what it sounds like. It's a program where we match you up with a remote associate, one dedicated person on an ongoing basis for a minimum of 30 hours a month, all the way up to 160 or more. Um, and again, we have different levels of expertise and background for these folks. And of course, based on your market, your practice area, there's going to be that's good. Those are going to be factors in how much you're paying the freelancer for work and how much you can build their work to your client while staying compliant with the ethics rules that require us to build the work of anyone in our, our law firm to the client at a, a reasonable market rate. That's the test. Um, it's typically a professional rule of conduct uh, 1.5. We have a white paper on that on the website in the homepage if you would like to read more. But okay, so for a subscription example, Let's say you are in North Carolina and your practice area is family law and you need, you've decided you need 60 hours of help from a remote associate every four weeks. The program runs in four week increments and you are trying to figure out what you should pay. Again, these are market rates that, that are showing. This is what the Clio data is showing you uh, rates that are billed to the client and our guideline to hiring attorneys is typically that you can pay 35 to 40% of um, this rate. 
uh, because you're not paying the overhead that you typically pay with a full-time associate. So, you know, using these rates and looking at the years of experience, I calculated that somewhere between $90 an hour and $160 an hour would be a very reasonable rate to pay the freelancer for work done in a subscription. Okay. What can you bill this to your client? Well, again, the data is right there in front of you. I think anywhere from $150 an hour to upwards of $280 could be reasonable depending on the years of experience of the freelancer. So again, the exact, these are ranges, the exact numbers are going to depend on who you find through your search for a remote associate. Um, but again, our team is going to help you with all of these things. What did the economics of this look like? Okay. Um, okay, let's for purposes of example, I forgot I put this part. Let's say that you, through Law Clerk, you're able to find a remote associate that you're going to pay 110 an hour and you decide you're able to bill them at 250 an hour, that those are reasonable rates. And you know, to me, 250 an hour is right in line with that data that Cleo is giving us in the chart there based on state and based on practice area. So the economics of this um, are pretty compelling. Okay, you're paying Law Clerk for 60 hours of work at 110 hours or 110 per hour you are then getting 60 hours of work, which you've decided you can bill to the client at 250 an hour. That has the potential to bring in an additional revenue to your firm of $15,000 for a month um, with a profit of 8,400 just for one month, which over the course of a year could surpass six figures, which I mean, these are huge numbers, especially if you're a solo, if you're a small firm, to be able to bring in and drive this much additional revenue, not to mention all the work you're going to be getting done too, that you can maybe sleep a little bit more, you know, avoid those two and 4 a.m. work sessions that were on the chart. Um, this is a total game changer for so many attorneys. Um, and again, maybe you feel like some of these numbers are high or low. You can see how you can easily make a big difference. Now, sometimes lawyers say, well, what if they only bill, you know, 57 hours? Even if you're missing out on three hours for a month, it's a still win. And with our rollover program, you can roll over up to 10% of the hours, excuse me, up to 25% of the hours to your next four-week period. But enough math. Uh, I hope this is showing how um, some of the data, some of the thought process about uh, pricing projects, about what numbers are reasonable for subscription. And again, um, know that this is something our team is here to help you with. We can talk you through, we can help you analyze this data and see what feels right to you and your judgment for your firm. So um, that's our recap. Again, big thanks to our friends at Clio for all the work they put into compiling the legal trends report every year. Um, I think it's fascinating. Again, you can go to clio.com, download a copy. You don't have to have an account with them to get the data. Um, and of course, if you have questions about how you can use this data for your next project or subscription, you can reach out to your uh, advisor at Law Clerk, or if you don't know who that is, you can also connect with us at support at lawclerk.legal. But I'm going to stop the uh, presentation now. And if you have questions, you have comments in the chat, we'd love to hear from you. Um, again, Brooke and I, I always love reading this report. If you haven't read the whole thing, I would encourage you to go do that because I'm sure there's other data points that would stick out to you that maybe didn't stick out to Brooke and I. Um, but we wanted to at least give you an overview today. And we did that pretty quick, about under 40 minutes. So, um, well, thank you so much for joining us. And uh, we hope to see you at lawclerk.legal again really soon. Thank you. 